I believe God's put a word in my spirit from the Holy Spirit to, to speak to us and to make sure I pastor us as a global church as effectively as possible. So if you would go with me to John real quick, Gospel of John, we'll get right into it. Just stay standing for one more moment. I love to stand for the reading of God's word, to honor it and to acknowledge that it has transformational power in our life. John chapter six, verse one, it says sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a, a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages could not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? For this sudden series, we broke out our vision series in the midst of our summer series and calling it Spare No Expense. God gave me a word at the beginning of it and the word was scrappy. Now this season is gonna look a little scrappy. So I wanted to unpack that today and I wanted to preach to you a sermon I'm entitling Scrappy Faith. Scrappy Faith. Anybody ready to get scrappy up in this church today? All right, well, if you are ready, then I want you to prepare your hearts. I want you to prepare your minds. I want you to find five people around you, the scrappiest looking person around you, and just without offending them, just say, it's good to be scrappy with you. Would you do that real quick? It's, it's good to get scrappy today. Amen, every location. Come on. Come on, Honolulu. Come on, Chicago. Let's go, Oakland. Let's get scrappy. Oakland know how to get scrappy. So as I said last week, we launched into our vision series with a major announcement around the incredible opportunity that we have before us as a church to purchase our very first permanent location. Now, now let's just say we had uh, varying responses of enthusiasm to that announcement. For instance, there were those that just clapped that have been here from the start and have literally been praying for something like this for the last nine years. And so when you're doing nine years of set up, tear down, when church for you isn't just a nice little section of your day, that it is your whole day. For those that at some point in their last nine years have said, this is harder than a work day, servant Jesus, you would be celebrating emphatically. There are others who I got to speak to literally last week that have been to been at Vibe just for a couple of weeks, brand new to Vibe, but also just as excited to be at the start of something. Because, you know, it's like we couldn't be there at the start. We didn't even know you existed. I wasn't even a Christian back then. But I'm so excited because they get to be at the start of a new chapter. You get to be at the origin story. And understandably, there are others that were hesitant to show their excitement because they're soberly aware of what it's going to take. It's like, I don't want to get too excited just yet, Pastor. We're not there yet. However, there was one person who didn't seem to like the announcement at all. It was fascinating to, to me to see on social media that someone had gone to the effort to set up a troll account and was literally trolling every single comment on the Vive Church account. And, and unfortunately, my, my social media are way too fast. They just blocked this person way before I could respond, probably for the better, but but honestly, I, I wish they hadn't because I was, I was wanting to amen everything they were trolling. In fact, they weren't that quick because I got a screenshot before they delete. I want to put the screenshot up. This was on the church Instagram account. And you can see, I don't, trust me, you can look it up. It's a fake troll account. But, but every person who commented some kind of excitement about the announcement said, uh, uh, Tanisha, who's in our San Jose campus, take your 401k, inheritance, savings, everything, give. Said it twice, <laughs> just in case it wasn't clear. Uh, uh, Alexia, give your retirement to Adam. Said it twice, just in case. Just literally, literally comment after comment, trolling. And, and, and everyone was texting me, did you see this troll who's trolling the account? I'm like, 
Do you not see they're working for Jesus? <laughs> I wanted to amen everything. That's a, I didn't think about your retirement. Let's do the retirement thing. Your retirement's a long way off. Right now is faith. Right now is a moment. Like, like I literally wanted to take, I wanted to just, I wanted to like take each one and echo whatever that person's troll name account is. I wanted to echo it and be like, that's exactly what we got to do. Can I be really, really emphatically clear? Because someone said, I think Pastor M just wants your money. That's exactly what I want. I thought I was abundantly clear. I don't want your well wishes. I don't want your social media comments. I don't even want your prayers. I prayed. God said, yes. Now what are you going to do? I want your money. We need your finances. We needed to go for, I'm, from I'm praying about it, pastor, to now I prayed and the Holy Spirit didn't. He said, what are you praying about? You don't need to pray whether to, you need to pray how much. Like in what scenario? I would love it. I've had conversations all week with different people, investors, and I'm like, you know, I'd love you to partner with the kingdom of God. And the response I always get is, well, I'll pray about it. I want to so badly say, what are you praying about? <laughs> like in what scenario does the Holy Spirit say, don't be generous to my kingdom, to my house? Every cent that we raise is going to build the house. It's not going to a private jet for our youth pastor, Ben. Or some other stupid wish. It's going to build the house of God that will result in lives being transformed for eternity. That is what it's going to. So the only prayer that is valid in these moments is, God, how far can I stretch? God, can you illuminate ways for me to stretch that I haven't seen yet? I haven't seen yet. So I want to be clear in my ask, just in case the troll is watching online. <laughs> Would you please consider partnering with us financially in our goal to raise $8 million so we can purchase this 80,000 square foot building. And could you do it above and beyond the tithe? <laughs> I ain't asking you to reroute your tithe. <laughs> Just got to be a real good pastor today. Your husband's not going to come. Hey, I decided we need a vacation. So we're going to take the mortgage this month and we're going to, no, 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 no. We're not rerouting the tithe. We're going above and beyond. This is an above and beyond offering. Am I, am I coming? Is the speakers on? Am I coming through loud and clear for our global church? So partner with us, partner with us. Permanent place, a place of transformation. And truthfully, I'm not one bit surprised by the opposition. In fact, you know what I've learned this week? I've learned that a lot of people have a really severe misunderstanding around what faith is, because I've received some pretty uh, uh, wild and theologically incorrect statements come into my inbox and need to be even in person, statements that sound like faith, but actually are straight up false. And honestly, I've known for a long time that it's way more attractive to have a hyper faith talk than a practical faith walk. It's toxic within the church to just have this faith talk and to be able to spout these great faith sounding vocabulary and words and apply scripture that actually has no action attached to it. In fact, what you're going to find all the way throughout Scripture is more emphasis on the faith walk than the faith talk. That are you going to walk it out? What are you going to do as a result of this faith that's active in and through your life? And what I find is that, that sometimes we can speak faith but never really have the practical application of it in my life. Which is honestly why I felt the Holy Spirit impressing on me to correctly pastor us as a global church today around what faith really is. So let me show you something, and I want to start in Hebrews, because here we possibly have one of the greatest and clearest articulations of what faith is. Hebrews 11.1, 1, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Now, what this passage does, and you're going to have to track with me, lean in, I want to teach you before I get really preaching today. I want to teach you what this passage is actually illuminating in one single sentence. It talks about both what is seen 
and what is unseen. It talks about what's hoped for, and yet it also refers to the assured of, what we are assured of, what we are hoping for, what we're believing for, but also at the same time, not what you're hoping for, what you're assured of. Two elements where in most instances would almost contradict each other. However, in the realm of faith, they complement each other. And at the risk of, you know, possibly allowing things to get a little weird for the new Christians, it reveals that faith employs both the natural and the supernatural. Faith employs the natural and the supernatural. That faith requires both of these elements to be a functional faith. To not just be a hyper faith statement, you can just be in the spirit and have hyper faith statements. Without the natural, it will not be a functional faith movement. What am I talking about? I'm talking about two distinct and very separate realms that never actually operate independently. You see, the natural realm is the here and now realm. That's the realm that we're in, the, the, the realm in which we see, we feel, we experience, and what we would refer to as our reality. That's the, that's the realm of the natural. However, at the same time as this realm is existing that we're existing in, the, the natural realm, there, there is what the Bible illuminates often and consistently throughout Scripture, that there is a spiritual realm, a supernatural realm, a realm just as real as the physical realm, but invisible. And throughout Scripture, we see it, uh, a constant connection being made between the natural realm and the supernatural realm, that there is constant connections. Jesus emphasizes this more than Anyone else in the Bible, we see Jesus teaches the disciples this in Matthew 16, where he says in verse 19, he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Likewise, there's another section where Jesus uh, is teaching the disciples. The disciples ask Jesus, how should we pray? And in a, a section of scripture that we now know as the Lord's prayer, what Jesus emphasizes is he, he emphasizes that we should pray God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He makes sure that the crux, the central point of the prayer as the saints should be to connect heaven and earth. That we need to be the intermediary between the natural and the supernatural. That our job as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, those that are spiritually awakened to the reality of Jesus need to understand that we have the connection between what's natural and what's supernatural. And believe it or not, this is one of our main jobs as the saints, to do things in the natural that will unlock the supernatural. Are you staying with me? To do things in the natural that will result in a supernatural unlocking. That's our job. Actually, one of our greatest jobs, every single job that you have, uh, maybe you don't like the word job, every, every single, uh, how can I say that? Because you're meant to be a soldier in the Lord's army. Every command from Christ, every commission, we like that one better. Every commission, we like that better. It's a great commission. <laughs> Every commission from Christ involves us doing something in the natural to achieve a supernatural outcome. I'm glad three people are with me and convinced. I'm sure Honolulu are like just amen, Pastor. We, we see it. We see it. We see it. There, is, there is this interconnecting play between the, the realms that we exist in, that everything that happens in one realm, does not happen independently of another realm, and vice versa. This could be kind of weird, almost hippie-seeming kind of stuff when I hear myself talk it out loud, but, but to understand it in your spirit, that I don't just exist on one dimension, that I don't just exist removed from a spiritual dynamic that's happening as a believer. I can check out if I want, but it doesn't make it less real. It doesn't make it less effective. It doesn't make it less important and powerful in our world when we realize that everything I do has a spiritual effect, good and bad. Good and bad. Like you ever thought of the realm of addiction, what, what, why addictions happen in people's lives? Because there's a spirit attached to that addiction. 
it's not just a physical habit. There is a spiritual, a, a, a spirit that's trying to keep you bound. Is what Paul says. But be loosed in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, for whomever the Son sets free has set you free indeed. Therefore, now stay free. So, so in saying stay free, don't do the natural things that got you spiritually bound. Don't, don't, don't go looking at that stuff and expect to stay free. If, if you want to stay spiritually free, change your habits, your natural habits, your physical habits. Your, the, there, there is a connection. It's not less spiritual to form healthy habits. There's an interplay. For too long, we have had this dynamic happening in the kingdom of God where it's, well, in my spiritual zone, I'm this, but, you know, I'm going to do what it, no, 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 there is a, there, we are body, mind, soul, spirit. There, there is a, there is an interplay with everything that God has created and it does not act independently, but cohesively together. You with me? You with me up the back? Yeah, 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 yeah. With me in Oakland. Come on. And so what we need to understand is that we need to navigate as Christians a firm understanding when it comes to faith that the connection between the natural and the spiritual is actually at its most potent in the realm of faith. What happens is we, we come around a big vision like the one we have before us. It's easy to forget to approach it by faith. And so what happens is people in order to cope with or even sometimes comprehend the impossible task that God will often put before us, like this one, raising $8 million in 45 days, we, we find ourselves kind of throwing out false statements that sound correct. They aren't, but they try to encourage us. Like, like if God's in it, it will happen. Some of you are like, that's not a good one. <laughs> like if God is in it, it will happen. In fact, this happened all the time to me when I was trying to, we were trying to church plant. We were youth pastors at the time and I was trying to, you know, go to different business leaders and, and, and raise money to support us going to another country to start a church. And at that time, I was working for a business guy and I was part-time, you know, selling cell phones for him and his shop. And, and, and I, I sat down for a meeting with him, a lunch meeting. I made sure I paid for the lunch too, you know, uh, just trying to, you know, engage in the, in the purpose of heaven. And I told him what we were about to do. Nobody knew yet but we're about to go on this journey. We're going to go to America and we're going to plant a church. And I remember his face of shock. He was like, oh, wah, wah. and he didn't have words. The first thing that came out was, are you sure? I'm like, am I, am I sure? <laughs> like I haven't debated this with God already. <laughs> like I haven't done like fasting and prayer and said, God, are you sure? No, I'm sure. That's why I'm coming to you. He's like, what do you need from me? I said, any money. <laughs> You're a businessman. I don't need pastoring. <laughs> I'm not asking for marriage advice. I'm asking for money. <laughs> and he said, you know, I'll pray about it. And I said, what does that mean? He said, you know what? I'll tell you this, though. If God's in it, it'll happen. I said, I, <laughs> I, I already know God's in this. <laughs> I don't know what God can do. I'm not asking you to tell me what. I'm asking, what will you do? Okay. You see, see what this statement actually does, if God's in it, it will happen, is actually, we've got to be careful that we don't make statements of faith, not faith. There is a big difference between faith and faith. I want to make sure we walk together on this one. If I'm coming across savage, it's very intentional. That there is a major, faith is rooted in a, Greek mythological style of celestial divination. That's what fate is. That if the planets align and the situations, then the outcome will show that it was purposed all along. Faith still has an open end to it. Faith is possibility. Faith is what's hoped for if you participate in the journey. Faith, faith is an invitation. Faith is an invitation. Faith invites us in. Faith will remove me from any responsibility. Wow. That's what faith does. Because wow. if it's up to faith, whether I participate or not, it'll happen if it was meant to be, if it was meant to be. 
So people throw out this, if God's in it, it'll happen as an excuse to not participate at all. But they're missing the fact that you're actually bypassing faith. See, faith is a declaration. Faith employs my creativity and draws on my resources that I have available to me so that God will do something miraculous through them. That's faith. There's a difference between a, a fake and a functional faith. And trust me, from my experience, faith is way more scrappy than elegant because it requires you to be a part of it. That wasn't a compliment. Faith, faith, faith means we need to get scrappy. Let me prove it to you through this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, a, a well-known Bible story that is recorded in both Matthew and John's gospel, by the way. However, I particularly like the way John sets it up because after setting the scene, Jesus was walked up onto a mountain. We find John illuminates this in verse five. Check this out. He says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. So Jesus just gone across the lake. He's perched himself up on a hillside. And then to his surprise, there's a great crowd coming. Sees them off in the distance. They're not already there. They're on their way. And he says, Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already knew, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Now, now traditionally what we do, and I'm going to guarantee that at least 98% of us have heard sermon or four from this passage. However, we often approach this passage really from, from one angle. We, we approach it as a story of Jesus, how he's going to use the disciples to feed the large crowd and do an impossible task. However, the Holy Spirit showed me something this week. I'm wondering, could we be missing the actual emphasis of this passage and therefore missing much of the revelation that comes from this passage, which is Jesus actually using the large crowd and the impossible task to actually develop faith in the disciples even more than feed the crowd. I know we love to approach it from God just saw the need and he even found a way to meet the need because Jesus is compassionate and Jesus loves people and Jesus is just always wherever he goes looking for, for needs to meet. If that was the truth, by the way, Jesus would have stopped and never made his way through the crowd. Every crowd that there was, there was one time where Jesus walked into Jairus' house and they said there were so many people, you know, the one where the woman with the issue of blood reaches out and touches him. There were people pushing up against him. Do you think they were just crowding around to hear? They, were, they had needs. They had, they had toothaches. They had foot aches. They had back aches. They had all these kinds of needs. And like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. If Jesus was just looking for an opportunity to do a miracle, he wouldn't make it one foot. But more than looking for a, a need to fill, he looks for a need to develop the saints. <laughs> he doesn't just look for a need to fill. God can fill every need. He shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. God can supply. He's got ample supply. But he doesn't look for a need to fill. He looks for a need to develop the disciples. In fact, coming from this angle is way more consistent with the rest of Scripture in the three years that Jesus was on the earth ministering, where he was trying to develop 12 disciples who would carry this on after he ascended. So it wasn't like he was just going to take a break from developing the disciples, just say, oh, I see a need coming. I better fill this. Uh, I know what I'm going to do. I'll just, you know, just trick the disciples. No, no, he wasn't trying to trick the disciples. He was trying to get them to see something. See something. The crowd just provided a perfect opportunity to develop faith, to develop faith. So he sees the crowd and he turns to the disciples. He turns to the disciples, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? You know, this, this week I confronted a notion on my social media that I've heard so much in ministry that if it's God's will, it's God's bill. That's the same as, you know, if God's in it, it'll happen. A more poetic way that people throw at you every time you're trying to raise money, if it's God's will, it's God's bill, brother. And, and that ain't true. <laughs> At least it's not in this case. <laughs> he literally says, where? Where are we going to buy? Where are we going to buy, guys? Where's the money going to come from to feed all these people? Where, where are we going to? I got a will that I want to do here. 
I'm giving you the bill, church. Literally what God says. This is what Jesus says in Scripture. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. It's completely incorrect. Here he gives the disciples the bill. Check it out. I love this. Philip answered him and said, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. He immediately identifies with the impossible. How many people just really resonate with Philip? Like eight months wages, eight months wages, eight million dollars, eight million, whether it's eight months wages or eight million dollars, how many people know the gap always gets the attention? The gap will always get the attention in the situation where faith needs to be present. Like every time God presents us with an opportunity to step out with faith, it's, it's gap that gets the attention. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Whether it doesn't make it matter how big or how small the, the gap is. Jesus wasn't trying to get them to look at the gap. He was trying to get them to look at what they got. That's, that's the intention of Jesus. Even in this vision, God is not trying to intimidate you with the gap. He's trying to stir your faith to see what you've got, church, what we've got together, what we've got to move by faith, which is why I like what Andrew did. He, 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 he check it out. He chimes in and reveals what he's got in verse eight. He says, and another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? He, he starts out with looking for what he's got, but then he compared what he's got against the gap. Uh, look what we got. Uh, uh, but but look, look at the gap. Uh, look what I got. Uh, but look at the, the gap. And I, and I do like this because right here is where we see the disciples get scrappy because truthfully, they themselves didn't have anything. Like they were literally had nothing. But they didn't let their nothing stop them from looking. They began to look around and they began to get resourceful. And this is where what a scrappy faith looks like, by the way, church. It, it looks like getting creative with ways to generate some resources because this ain't God's bill, this is my bill. And when you take the ownership of the kingdom of God, you don't just put it back on God. Well, God, if this is what you want to do, it'll happen. No, you, you hear from God and you say, God, I'm the one that's going to make this happen. Right now, I might not know how, but I will find a way. I'm good for it. Choose me, Lord. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is searching the whole earth, looking for those hearts who are ready and willing. What do you think that means? The person is going to be said, bless me, God. No, no. He's like, who can I use? Who can I use? Who can, who's going to be an agent of the new kingdom? Who's going to be an agent across the earth? Who is going to put their hand up? And instead of saying, God, bless me. God, use me. Get creative. In fact, we've got people all over our community right now getting real creative with making stuff and selling stuff just, just to be a part of the purpose of heaven. I love that kind of faith. The kind that says, Though I don't have much, I'm not allowing this to limit my participation in this. What I cannot afford to do is disqualify what I've got because of the size of the gap. This is what Andrew started to do. He, he started out scrappy. Look, we found a boy who had something. It was small, but it was something. So while he was looking at the loaves and the fish, it was something. Then we looked at the gap, it was nothing. <laughs> When he's looking at the, the resource, it was something. When he looked at the task, it became nothing. Faith is a matter of perspective. Faith is a matter of where you fix your vision, what you begin to look in the spirit. You can look at the natural or you can look in the supernatural and you've you got to connect the two. You've got to look at what you've got and not disqualify it as nothing because in your hands it might be limited. But you're missing the fact of what something can be in the hands of God. Stay with me. He says, how far will they go among so many? The worst thing that could happen in this season for our church is we're trying to stretch and reach for an impossible task would be for someone to disqualify their participation because they considered it insignificant. The worst thing that could happen would be for any single person that calls Vive Church their home to disqualify their part because they deem it insignificant compared to the gap. 
Because as I was saying earlier, faith combines the natural and the supernatural. When we bring what we have in the natural, God has a way of doing something supernatural with it. But when we have something that we consider nothing, we eliminate the supernatural element of God. Stay with me. This is, the, this is the case for a spiritual gift as much as it is as a financial contribution. That when we have something that we consider nothing, we eliminate the supernatural. Now, I was not a math major at school. I wasn't what you would, call, would have called book smart. However, I was street smart enough to know that a teacher would always give you these rules that were like tricks. And I learned all the tricks that got me through. I didn't know much of the mathematic laws, but I knew some of the ones that would trick you, like the multiplication of zero. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All the other street smarties. <laughs> I took note of those ones because I won't get, I won't get fooled. I wasn't going to get tricked. And I would go through the exam and I would look for all the ones that had a zero. I knew instantly, zero. Go find those, the easy ones first. You know what I mean? I didn't want to miss out and not get an easy one. Because I knew that the law of multiplication is that anytime any number is multiplied by zero, the answer is always zero. And they try and get you too. Try and get you with 146 times 56 multiplied by eight, multiplied by zero. And they, zero, I knew it was zero straight away. Because it didn't matter what came before it or even after it. If zero was in the mix... It would always equal zero. This is the same with the formula of faith that anything with zero is multiplied and ends up being zero. That when you have something, God can multiply it. But the moment you determine your something to be nothing, it always ends up as zero because God can't multiply zero. He's looking for something. He's looking for seed. He's looking for something in the natural to put supernatural on it. This is how faith functions. It's scrappy. It's scrappy. But it requires participation. Elegant would be, we just have one major donor, write the whole check. There you go, church. <laughs> Glory. And we all go, oh. That was easy. But the problem is, we still act like stupid saints, saying if God's in it, it'll happen. God can see the crowd, but he's looking at the saints. God can see the need but he's looking at the faith that it's going to produce in us as we don't disqualify what we've got as insignificant, taking something and making it nothing. God can do a little with a lot, but he can't multiply zero. That's what we have here with the teaching the disciples. To them, it was just five loaves and two fish. It was scrappy. I mean, can we acknowledge the faith of the small boy for a moment? Because he had five loaves two fish. <laughs> How many of us in that moment would say, well, God, you have one fish. I'll keep one. You take three loaves, I'll keep two. That's not a spare no expense attitude. <laughs> the boy literally said, God, this is what I got. You have it. That means I, I might miss out. I might have to sacrifice. In the meantime, but the level of my faith is spare no expense. It's not God, you take half. It's God, if I have a way to meet a need and it looks small, but God, if I give it all, if I come with that kind of spare no expense attitude, it was literally five loaves and two fish multiplied by spare no expense faith. That, that, that resulted in a miracle where there were leftovers, <laughs> not just for the crowd, I'm sure even for the boy. Imagine returning home to mom. I know, I didn't go fishing. It just multiplied. You know, there is a way that God will work supernatural into the natural. But it always requires a, a natural movement on behalf of the saints for God to do something supernatural with it. It's what it means to get scrappy church. Scrappy faith doesn't need to look elegant. It just needs your involvement. So this kind of scrappy faith is going to require us to do the impossible. To achieve a vision that is monumental. But it's a 
kind of faith that all of us have to be somewhat used to, at least most of us here. Because it's the same kind of faith that brings us into relationship with Jesus. What I'm putting before you is not the first time I'm asking you to operate by faith. I'm just trying to draw you back to the moment you stepped into relationship with Jesus because it required a scrappy kind of faith. A scrappy kind, not not because Jesus is scrappy, He's actually perfect, but because I'm scrappy. (laughs) Like I don't bring a lot to the table with Jesus. In fact, I don't bring much at all. I often bring, we bring a, a busted up life, a broken life, an offended life, a guilty life, a, a life riddled with bad decisions. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We, we just bring not even put together stuff. It's like leftover stuff. And, and the moment we disqualify what we've got in comparison to what God wants to do in our life, we eliminate the gift of salvation. We eliminate what God can do. But when you simply come to God and say, take me as I am, God, that's literally the moment where God does something powerful and supernatural with your life, where He transforms you from the inside out and He puts you onto a brand new path and He puts you into a whole brand new life and He says, watch what I can do with that scrappy thing that you thought it was. Watch what I can do with that broken vessel. Watch what I can do with that busted up life. Watch as I will put my glory inside it and I will let my grace come through it and what was something that you determined nothing, but if you just bring it to me, watch what I can do with it. Watch what I can do with it. In fact, stand to your feet, everybody. Stand to your feet. We've got people on crutches standing. You can stand too. Every location, stand to your feet because I wanted to make sure you hear this. Yeah, I'm trying to preach faith in connection to this great vision that God has before us. But more importantly, I'm trying to connect faith into your life for what it means to be a son and daughter of Jesus to walk with hope in your heart, to walk with purpose. It starts scrappy. It starts basic. It starts by saying, God, I don't have a lot. You see, if anybody knew my life and the list of decisions, you you would disqualify yourself. You'd be like the disciples, but what is this for what God wants to do? But instead you need to be like the little boy and say, God, if this is all I got, would you take it? And that's the invitation that Jesus needs to do something miraculous in your life. I'm here today to tell you that God wants to do something miraculous in your life. That God wants to transform your life. That God wants to take something that you would consider scrappy and make it supernatural and do something so amazing with it that you will be in awe for the rest of your life at the goodness and the grace of God. The only thing you cannot afford to do is disqualify yourself. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't take something and consider it nothing. Say, God, what I've got, I give to you. In fact, I want to do this across every location around the world right now. I want to pray for those that today are recognizing I need Jesus. I thought I had to have a put together faith. I thought I had to have my life presentable for Jesus to accept me. But you're telling me that Jesus will take me as I am. That's exactly what I'm telling you. That God just wants to take you just as you are, jacked up, messed up, crooked, broken, history that you're ashamed of, life that you're afraid of, all these things. God says, just bring it and watch what I can do with it. Just come as you are, come as you are. So I want to pray for some people today. I'm not going to embarrass people. I just want to pray for you. I want to help you make that prayer, your prayer, to say, Jesus, I know I need you in my life. And I haven't had the boldness to pray the prayer of salvation pray the prayer to make you Lord but today I want to pray that prayer so maybe you could do something with me across every location around the world right now if you would just right where you are close your eyes I want you to close your eyes so that this becomes a moment between you and heaven this becomes a moment between you and God and if you're here and you're saying I need I need to get scrappy right now I need to get scrappy with my faith that I thought I had to put my life together to come to God, but you're telling me God wants me just as I am, then I need to get scrappy with this. And I wanna pray for some people that wanna extend their faith today and acknowledge I need Jesus. And I'm gonna pray for you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed all over the world right now, whatever location you're in and you're acknowledging I need Jesus today, pastor, pray for me. Then right where you are, you're saying, I want to be a part of this prayer. 
just give me a little wave so I know and your campus pastors know who we're praying for. Who is that? Who is that? Yes. Yes. Just give me a wave. I see it. Yes. 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 Who else? Up the back. Yes. Hands all over this place. Who else is getting scrappy today? Yes. I see that. Yes. I see that. Yes. I see that. Who else? Yes. In the middle there. Who else is getting scrappy? Yes. Over the side. Yes. Come on. Who else today is saying, I- I'm coming to God just as I am. I thought I had to have it together, but I'm realizing now that God just wants something and I'm not nothing and God can do a lot with a little. So I'm bringing my little to God for him to do something major with. Who else? Who else? Who else? Yes, yes, yes. God, you see each and every hand. and Better still than a hand, you see the heart of man. You see the condition of our heart. You see the cry of our heart. God, I pray right now over every person all over the globe who has acknowledged their need for you today. By raising their hand, God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would comfort them, you would encourage them, and you would reveal to them that you are with them. 